Cool. Hello, everyone. Hey, uh, good morning. Thanks for coming here. It's been uh, probably been a long week. The last couple of days have been crazy here, and the traffic's not been fun either. So hopefully, it's been working out well for you guys. Some of you have made your way from a long, you know, different parts of the country, many different areas. But I hope it's been worth it. And there's a lot of interesting things that we've been doing. So we want to talk a little bit about some of them. You've you know, heard our keynotes and the great products we have, et cetera. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning, right? The, the title says machine learning is not the future, which is kind of weird, given that we're talking about machine learning and everything we are doing here. But the point that I want to bring across here is it's, it's not really the future. It's part of everything we have today. As you're seeing with our products, as all the things that we're talking about, we're using machine learning today in everything we're doing. And I want to talk about some of that and, and tell you how you can do that too. But first, let's start with where this all started, right? So, and this goes back to 1907. I don't know how many of you remember this, TikTok from The Wizard of Oz. He's one of the early versions of um, robots in modern times, really. Although there are references to automatons going back to the 5th century BC and stuff, even the Egyptians and others way back when. But in the modern times, this is probably one of the earliest references to something that was close to a robot. Any of you familiar with TikTok? How many of you are familiar with TikTok? Not too many. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. So, so th this one is, uh, in fact, the, the term robot was, he wasn't even coined back when TikTok was created by Frank Baum. And what this robot would do is it had a, you know, a winding thing, and you, you needed to wind the robot, and it would run. And it was almost, it could do pretty much what a human could do, but not really be alive. And it was a great reference to things that we've always wanted to do. And so a lot of this AI and robotics and a lot of these things have been part of science fiction for a very, very long time. In fact, a lot of what we do today in science has been driven by what people, literary authors, et cetera, are able to really build up and, and think about what the future might be like. right? Uh, this is one example, but there are many, many more. For example, if you know, some of you have read Asimov, he has a bunch of books, and he has this whole robotic series, again, way back in the 30s, where he talks about robots and how they might be like and what the, the kind of things that come with it. And that was very interesting. A lot of people over the years have been inspired by these science fiction books and movies to, to do a lot of interesting things. Another, one, another example of that is back in the 70s, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's this m robot called Marvin, which is you know this uh, depressed. It's always depressed. It's always talking about these uh, things he's not happy about. He's just too smart for all the things happening around it, and it's a uh, it's really a great one, a great example of you know what thing what people have been thinking about what's going to happen in the future. In a, going to another example, Star Trek, right? Another thing, the, the example that I put here, that's Lieutenant Colonel Data in Star Trek, who talks about, you know, this is a poem he composes, which is, uh, I thought is pretty funny. And how people have been thinking about AIs and what they would do, right, and what they would be doing in the future. In this case, again, it's like a robot, like a humanoid, somebody who can do a lot of things, but is not quite human. Then coming, coming to more recent times, more closer to like 2001, if you've seen Steven Spielberg's movie AI, called AI itself, they have these mechanical robots that can really do, that look like humans, that can do all kinds of things, but they don't feel. And then they build this little kid, uh, David, who can actually feel and love as well and really changes how the perception is and, and, and what they really, you know, how they think about AI or what it means to the people around them. And then much more recently, there's this movie called Her, like in 2013, which talks about AIs without the ship, without the robotics and all of that, but, but AIs just that live within, the, within your computer as an OS, essentially, that can interact with you. That's your assistant, but much more than that, right? It can do all... Uh, it actually feels as well, it understands things, et cetera. So all these are great, right? There are so many different things that people have been talking about, people have been thinking about, but these are still science fiction, right? This is not really what machine learning is about today, 
Right? This is still, this has always been the future. It's still the future. Maybe at some point it'll be a reality, but that's not what, where we are today. That's not what we are talking about. But there are some real things that we can do today, and, and those are some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So we've actually made, over the last few years, real progress in terms of all the different things that we can do with AI, with machine learning, right? Use, use all the products that you see around you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. There, there's so much in there that has benefited from machine learning, from what we call AI as well. And so this is a, you know, some of the a small list of products really at Google that we've made that use machine learning in some ways. But at Google, we really think about any time we think of a product, there's, of course, programming, and you build it, and you do all sorts of things with it. But machine learning is an integral part of everything we do in building that, right? Because we want these products to be really smart, to give, give you the right things, to not just follow your actions, but really give you the right things when you want them, as you want them. And I'll go, through, go over some examples about these in later slides as well. So, before I go into other things, let's just go a little bit into what deep learning and machine learning is about. And I'm just quickly going to give you some examples on a website that we have. So, you know, part of the slide is going to talk about TensorFlow. And recently, we put this site up called playground.tensorflow.org that allows you to play with neural nets and allows you to really do different kinds of things and allows you to really understand how these networks work, how machine learning works, and be able to you know, play with some of those problems. So I'm going to start with a very, very basic problem, classification. Right. The, the goal in this case is there are two kinds of points. I just want to classify whether it's A or B, in this case, the orange or the blue ones. right? And I'm going to use the very simplest case. Right. It's a very simple linear classification, if any of you guys know what that is. But the idea is you have some inputs. In this case, you know, the x-axis and the y-axis are inputs. And based on those in two inputs, you want to decide if it's a blue one or a white one, or an orange one. And so what this model is going to learn is some parameters to figure out, OK, if I get some point, I get an x1 value and an x2 value, how do I decide that? Right? It's some mathematical computation that it needs to do. So in this case, it does that iteratively. Let's just quickly run this. I, I've just set it up as a linear model. So let's just run it very quick. And as you see here, it's looking at x1 and x2. And very, very quickly, it figures out how to separate this out. It just draws a line in the middle. And it's just optimizing where, where, what that line looks like, how to separate these out very simply, right? So this was a very easy problem. This is typically not how real problems are, but it's a great place to start. So, so let's go to a slightly more complex problem now. So let's go to this one here, where you know, now you still have those two kinds of points, but now they are clustered differently. So there's one in the center as a circle, and the, the rest are around it. So can we actually solve this using the same kind of methods? Can we actually classify using the same thing? If I run this, do you think it would work? Any guesses? Let's try it out. So it's trying to separate this out. It's basically trying to draw a line, but it's lost, right? It's really not making a progress if you, if you see what's happening here. So there are a few things you can do about this, right? One, in terms of classification, again, going a little bit into machine learning, uh, into the details, you can add more features, more kinds of things about the, the input data that help the model understand or how to separate them. So if you guys remember your math back from high school or college, the, in, in this particular case, given how these clusters are structured, if you looked at a couple more features from based on the inputs, like in this case, x1 squared and x2 squared, you can probably use those to separate this out better. So let's try this. Let's add these two and see what happens. And taking those two values, now it knows how to separate those and you know, clearly separate it out into two different classes. So this works. This is great, right? This is what happens or used to happen in machine learning very often for every single thing that you do. You take a bunch of inputs. You want to solve some problem. It's typically the inputs themselves are not in the same kind of mode that you need to solve the problem. And what you do is called feature generation, where you are combining or processing those features in different ways to really solve your problem, right? But there's a lot of work you need to do in figuring out the right features that make sense. In this case, it was a simple problem, so we knew x squared, x1 squared or x2 squared would work. 
But in some cases, the problem is not as simple. And you really need to do a little bit more. So for, for those kind of cases, uh, you know, we have something called deep learning, which, which seems to work really well. So let's go, to, go back to this example, and, and let's see if we can solve it in a different way as well. So let's take, take out these two features first. Let's change this linear to a nonlinearity. In this case, I'm going to pick a rectified linear unit. And I'm going to add a hidden layer with a few more neurons. So what this is doing is it has some inputs, as we said, in this case, just x1 and x2. I'm adding another layer, which is basically trying to combine those inputs in whatever way is interesting to solve our particular problem. And then let's see if we can train this to actually solve the same problem as well. So if you see this, we took the same features, no feature generation. We just added one layer. And this is a simple problem, so one layer works. And it's very easily able to separate those out. Right? This is essentially what deep learning is doing for you. As you add more layers, it can understand and learn the right layers of abstraction that are the most interesting to solve your current problem. Right? And of course, it depends on the problem. It doesn't have to be a simple classification. It could be regression. It could be recommendation. Whatever you're trying to do, really, you can apply similar techniques to do that. So let's go back to our slides. You know, in a sense, deep learning is basically you know, the same machine learning ideas with more layers there that allow you to get different kinds of abstraction. Of course, as part of that, you get many, many more parameters. You learn things differently. This example is actually for what we call Inception v3, which is uh, our state-of-the-art image model for image classification. So you know, if you, and we'll go through some examples of where we use it. But this basically gives you something near human accuracy. So machine learning's been around for a long time, in fact, way more than 10 years. So what, what's really changed since then, right? One of them is more compute, definitely. Over the years, our computers have gotten faster. We have more of them. We've been using uh, newer chips, you know, CPUs, GPUs, now TPUs here. And so, so a lot of things that we're doing here with that, and more compute allows us to really build more complex models build bigger models, you know, but that needs a lot more, a lot, of, a lot of other things to go with it as well for that to work. In this case, better algorithms and more data help as well. So over the years, we've improved the algorithms slowly. You know, a lot of these algorithms that we talk about in deep learning are 30, 40, 50 years old. But over the last 10 years, we've seen some improvements in the right places. For example, in case of deep learning, there are some improvements to backpropagation or the kind of nonlinearities that we use that really make it much easier to optimize those. It used to be really, really hard to train some of these models, even if you had the compute, even if you had the data. Now it's much easier, and there are better techniques to do that. So the math and the algorithms has improved. And of course, the amount of data that we have, that keeps growing. And that's really something where machine learning can help. If you think about it, with small amounts of data, humans are great. You know, you can maybe read 10 pages or a book and understand that and sift it down. But what if you had a million pages? You can't really expect a human to go through those million pages, understand those, and summarize it for you. You really need some machines that can automatically do this for you. And that's really where machine learning comes in. So now let's talk a little bit about what's happening in research and machine learning now. Right? There's We've talked a little bit about science fiction, mentioned a bunch of products that, that are using this. And I'll go a little bit more into the products later. But let's talk a little bit about the research, where this is going, some of the examples of where things have made improvements in the recent past. So the first one I want to talk about is AlphaGo. Uh, how many of you have heard of AlphaGo? Wow, oh, quite a few. So if you remember like 10, actually almost 20 years ago now, there was Deep Blue, which is a similar chess computer. In some, some sense, it was similar that you know, the goal was, OK, can we really beat the best humans, Kasparov, the reigning chess champion at that time, using computers? And back in 1997 was the first time Deep Blue, which is this computer built by IBM, that actually uh, beat the world champion, beat Kasparov in a full championship match. That was pretty amazing, right? And that was 20 years ago. It took a long time to go from there to go. Partly because Go itself as a game is way more complex than chess is. The, the possibilities that you have at every level, at every step, are much, much bigger, much more than what chess is. And so one of the differences there is 
with Deep Blue, you could get away with some smarts and a lot of brute force, right? You could have a large supercomputer. You have some basic smarts and a lot of rules around, you know, there are a lot of chess players there that actually taught Deep Blue in the sense it would train them on, okay, here are the good moves, here are not, et cetera. Plus, allowing it to do a lot of brute force and trying out, okay, looking ahead, how many different moves you can do. Now, those same techniques just could not work for Go because of the different possibilities at every step. At every step, it can do a, a really large number of moves, and supporting that or being able to go past a few steps is extremely hard, even for modern-day computers. So what really worked in this case was a combination of smartness and the compute. And in case of smartness, they apply deep learning to figure out, okay, looking at a board, what kind of moves make the most sense? And then let's try them out and see what makes sense and you know, which ones of these play well. And so it's a combination of improved algorithms, improved machine learning, combined with the compute power as well. Another example is ImageNet which is this um, data set of a million images with a thousand classes of different kinds. In fact, a lot of classes are so close together that it's very hard even for humans who don't know about them to identify without learning. For example, there are breeds of dogs which look very similar, at least to me. Uh, for people who really know dogs, of course, it's easier. <coughs> over the last few years, over the last five years, the it, especially on this data set, this has really driven the state of where vision understanding for machines is. So about five years ago, the accuracy that computers would get was maybe 70, 75%. This was the measured top five accuracy, which is basically, is the, the, most ac the correct answer among the top five results that the computer predicts. Now, five years ago, this was something like 75%. Today, it's passed, it's over 96% which is considered to be better than human accuracy, really. Humans also make mistakes in this kind of thing. Right? So, so it's really coming a long way and just shows the kind of progress we can make if we really get down to improving machine learning. The, this one's an interesting one, taking the kind of image models that we've trained <coughs> and really letting them dream. You know, the, This is what we call deep dream. There, there are some folks at Google who basically took those neural networks and wanted to understand what's happening in these networks. What are they learning, right? And so in this case, what they did was took a few neurons in the, in the network, just let them uh, train from that point and, and try to see what we can generate from those neurons, what they might be understanding from the images, and sort of they converged to some of these. So in, in some of these images on the top right, it's basically started from some kind of palace or whatever, and it's combined those, and you know, it's hallucinating of that. The one on the top left, it has some fountains in there and a bunch of other things that's sort of combined. And, and this is very interesting because this is, um, in, in some ways, there are similarities to what people do as well. Of course, you know, this is a very different field. But, but it's starting to learn in, in many, many ways, right? Machine learning is really kind of doing the same kind of learning um, that people might do. So now I'm going to give you some examples. Let me just go to this and play some couple more videos for you. In, in this case, it's doing what? It's basically taking a video and applying different kinds of painting styles. So in this particular one, it's just taking a blue painting style and applying it to the existing video in real time. Now it's a charcoal sketch. This is just an example of how we are mixing machine learning with things like art to build all kinds of interesting things in the, you know, kind of interesting combinations of things that you can do with these. Yeah, here's another one where it you know, makes it look like a newspaper. So th this one's from a paper based on by Justin Johnson and others uh, here at Stanford. Let me give you another example of similar things that we can do. So th this one's interesting where the network learned from a bunch of Chinese characters. It looked at how they're drawn and was able to re draw completely new Chinese characters I'd never seen before. These aren't real characters, actually, right? For those of you who understand the script, I don't. But they, they look very real. Even for people who understand the script or who know the script, they feel like they're almost there. They're like clearly not the right character or anything that they've ever seen. But it's, it's really understanding what's happening there. It gets that it's supposed to look like this and is, is able to uh, understand that whole domain pretty well. I'm going to show you one couple more videos. 
here's one where um, it's basically learned from a lot of numbers. These are house numbers from Street View. Let's, let's just go back here and play it and pause it at the end. And so it's, it's learned a bunch of, it's looked at house numbers from Street View and, and is able to really generate those. It's actually never seen these particular numbers. The network is just generating them. This is the kind of things that these networks can do today. And the last one, in this case, it's actually generating faces. And so again, it learned from a large face data set and now is able to generate faces in all kinds of ways, right? Again, these are not faces it's seen directly. It's really generating them based on all its understanding of what faces look like. Yeah. The, another one that we've actually released very recently is this model to parse sentences. So, this is a very semantic parsing of sentences where it looks at a, at a sentence, in this case I booked a ticket to Google, and tries to understand what the subjects are, you know, all the gram grammatical stuff about that, actually things that I predict personally don't understand and it's hard for me to learn. But this, this is able to actually learn from a lot of sentences that were given to it. In this example, it's actually taking the sentence piece by piece and then, you know, building a tree of hierarchy and, you know, doing the parsing in this case. This kind of thing is extremely useful when you're trying to understand natural language. And this just goes to show how much these computers can understand the language that you and I speak. In some cases, better than humans can as well, or at least better than kids can. Here's another example, sort of going back to the data example where, you know, in science fiction they said, here's the sort of poem that a computer might generate. This, this is actually something that was generated by a real program today or, or a real um, model today. It's uh, clearly not great, but it, in this particular case, it just learned from a bunch of books. It read those books or understand, understood those books and was able to generate this, this particular um, poem, I guess. So now let's talk about, this is great for research. Now let's talk about a few products and how we are using them. So, you know, we had this slide early on where I showed you a bunch of products that we are using this. Let's go into some of those products. Let's see how we are actually using them. What are the kind of things we are doing with machine learning in these products? So first is search. You know, I'm sure most of you have, or probably all of you have used search or using search in some ways. This is a very good example of how machine learning is used. Now, the, the slide that I show you here, there are at least two ways we are using machine learning here. The first, if you use voice search here, so if you click that icon on the right for the mic and you say something, there's machine learning being used to understand what you're saying and converted it to text, right? So you have, you say something, that's really a bunch of bytes for the computer. It really, to convert that into actual English or whatever language you're speaking, it needs to understand that. And there are uh, pretty sophisticated machine learning models that do that for you today. Then the next part is once you have that, what results to show you, right? Google has billions or trillions of pages really indexed, which you probably don't even think about. What you see typically when you do that search is just 10 pages on that first page. And you really want those 10 pages to be the best ones, the most appropriate ones for you. In some cases, you might go to the next page or so, but most people are just going to look at that first page and make that decision. So how do we really take those billions of pages match those to your query, and then, you know, even then it's probably millions or maybe more, uh, and then put them down to those, boil them down to those top 10 pages. And that's, again, machine learning at work in many, many forms. We are taking all these pages, understanding your query, matching it to all the data we have. Maybe, you know, if you're looking for a restaurant in your Mountain View, we're going to leverage that and understand that that needs to be combined with the kind of pages that are there. If it's something else, again, Understanding the query and the documents together, combining them and then ranking them and sorting them, that, that's something that machine learning does really, really well. This example is of pictures. You know, we talked about vision models. They're actually in use in everything you do now. So for example, over the years, image collections, the, the amount of photos I have are huge, right? They're just growing. With digital cameras coming on, it's been so much easier to take pictures and just keep collecting them, right? You never throw them away. But then when you want to find a picture or you really want to go through those collections, it's really, really hard. So how can you do that? In this case, the same kind of research that I was talking about, which understands those images, is really indexing and labeling all the pictures you have in Google Photos. And in this particular example, if you search for cherry blossom, it really shows you all your pictures of cherry blossom 
and can display them for you. Okay. <coughs> Another example is email. So there's this thing called Smart Reply, which we launched a few months ago, which you might be using insert in email. And <coughs> what happens there is you, you, you get an email. You typically, in this case, you probably just want to get a, a quick, easy answer, right? And it just gives you some choices. Here, pick this one. And what it's doing is it's really understanding what your email thread is about and then suggesting a bunch of replies, ranking them, whatever makes the most sense, and showing the most interesting ones to you if, if it makes sense. Another one is Google Music, right? There, there are many things happening in there. And one of the things that we do is we recommend a lot of things that you might want to play, maybe albums that you might want to play, maybe actual songs that you might want to play, based on the time, based on what you're trying to do right now, right? based on your interests. It, it's really understanding all of that, sorting them, and again, ranking them, recommending the right things for you. We really want to make it easy for you to find what you want. You know, the ideal case would be you go there, let's say it's the afternoon, or let's say you're driving back from work, and you typically like to listen to, say, classical songs at that time. It should really just recommend you the classical song or maybe the top station that you do all, every time. You shouldn't have to look for it just because just before this, you were doing something else. So all of these are examples where machine learning can um, really make a difference and are helping us in our everyday lives. And one more that I'm going to talk about is spam. So everybody uses email. You know, a few years ago, maybe five, 10 years ago, spam was this huge issue for everyone where most of the email in your inbox was starting to be spam. You had to actually filter them out manually. So it's not that from that time on to now, spam is reduced. In fact, spam continues to increase. It's just that our filters and algorithms have gotten a lot better at recognizing what's spam. Again, they're not perfect. You, you'll occasionally still see spam, or maybe we would say something spam where it's not. But it, they're getting so much better that I don't go to my spam, for spam box and see what I might have missed. Or the other way around, I rarely get email that's actually spam, even though if you actually read the numbers about how much spam emails there are, these are still um, you know, way more, maybe 10 times more than the real emails of spam itself. <laughs> so, so lots of improvements in machine learning, lots of improvements in the products that are driven by machine learning, right? So it's not about the algorithms or the, the technology itself, it's about how do we apply it to the products that we build? How do we make things better for all the things that we're trying to do? Right? All of this technology and the algorithms and the compute that we are building, it's all towards solving real problems, solving real needs for things that we do today. So now let's talk a little bit about TensorFlow. <laughs> That's the product I lead. And it was built to help push machine learning forward. You know, our team is a research team, and you know, part of the goal for us was to really push machine learning forward, and that's why we built it. But that's not the end goal, right? We want to take that machine learning as well and apply it, like I was saying, in all of these products. And TensorFlow allows that, us to do that, and now you as well. Right? And I'm going to tell you how we can do this. So it is, it is open source. It's a machine learning library available on GitHub. It's, in fact, the most popular machine learning library. We, we open source six months ago, and it's very rapidly gone to the top. There's a lot of interest. There, there are a lot of people using it in all kinds of areas. Some of the research that I talked about are actually people outside Google who've taken up TensorFlow and used it in doing a lot of those, you know, uh, building those new things and new ideas. People are including it in different kinds of products as well. So at the core, it's a library that's, let, let's go a step forward. Um, <coughs> so what's this library for, right? There, there are many different things that we can do. Like I was saying, our group is doing a lot of research. So it is for researchers who want to take machine learning and really push it forward, make it much better than it is, improve the algorithms, improve how we can do things with it. So it is for them. But then there are data scientists who want to really take those algorithms Let's say you have data, let's say you have a product, and you want to improve that product by you know, applying this machine learning to the data that you have. And so the data scientists can take those algorithms, because they're also open now. They're made available to you on all kinds of places. You can take those. You can use those and make some improvements. And then there are the developers, like a lot of us here, actually, 
who are trying to make, say, an app and want to make it better, or say, deploy a product to their data center. And TensorFlow allows you to really take all the work that researchers and data scientists have done, and really run those same models, the trained models, in production using the exact same APIs without having to worry about, OK, how this seems great, but how am I going to deploy this to production, right? That's another complexity that, that's added. So we've definitely tried to make sure that from the beginning, from the point that you get started with machine learning, to actually pushing it out to production, it's a very short time cycle. You shouldn't be stuck because of infrastructure. That's taken care of you. It, it, that's taken care of for you. And you can focus on what's important for you in the most ways, right? Which is really building the products, helping your customers, helping your users. So just a couple of examples of TensorFlow. I'm not going to go too detailed into the code, but this is a very simple example where we two, they just take two inputs, do a matrix multiply, and you know, just print out the result. So what it's doing is, in the first two cases, it's creating two nodes in the graph. And actually, let me just, oh. Yeah, it's creating two nodes in the graph. And really you know, doing a multiplication, which is another node which takes the inputs from the other two nodes. And then the last one really evaluates based on those two inputs, combines them, and generates the output. This one's actually a regression problem. So we talked about classification earlier. In this case, it's trying to predict some values based on you, know, you have some inputs, you have some outputs, you want to learn to predict the outputs. It's basically doing something similar to what we were seeing on the playground where you're taking the inputs, you're multiplying it by a matrix, and uh, you, know, you have a loss that you're trying to optimize, which is a typical machine learning thing. And then you just loop through. So the last, the, at the end, you basically have these, you're going through a bunch of steps, and say 200 times in this particular case, and you, you know, just print this out. And over time, you're basically learning to predict things better. Again, very simplistic examples. Typical models might be much bigger, but in a lot of cases, you might also be able to use models that are already there. I um, wanted to just give you some examples of the kind of performance we provide, comparing it to some standard benchmarks that are there on uh, an open source website. And you know, early on when we launched TensorFlow, it wasn't the fastest library out there. And there were a lot of improvements that we have to do, had to do. But over the last six months, we've really focused on that. And at this point, it's really at the top in terms of you know, compare, comparable to everything else out there. And we continue to improve it. This is not the end of it. There are many more improvements that you can do. In, in this case, we are comparing you know, four different kinds of models. In this case, they happen to be all image models. And as you see, the, the, the lower is actually better. It, you know, in a few cases, it's just slightly worse. In, few cases, it's like, in, in one case, it's slightly better, and so on. So it's, it's roughly about the same ballpark performance at this point. Now, one thing you can do with TensorFlow as well is you can run it across many, many machines rather than running on just one machine. So the previous benchmark that I was showing you was basically running on a single GPU and you know, training these models on GPUs, something that a lot of people do. In this particular case, we're training on many, many more machines, so each machine having a single GPU, uh, going all the way to 100. And you can see it scales quite well. You know, in fact, up to 16, it's almost linear, and then it still continues to scale even past that. And this is something that we use internally as well to train really large models on large data sets, which is, as the data is growing, it's really important to be able to do this, to, to be able to run on clusters, which many of you probably do already. <coughs> Oops. So ne next, I'm going to talk a little bit about TensorFlow for poets. So there's actually a code lab for this as well, if you want to look at it, look at it online, or um, I believe there's a place here too. So the idea here is, let's say you have a bunch of images, in this case flowers, and you want to learn to recognize those flowers, right? Or maybe just identify if it's a flower or if these are five different kinds of flowers. And what you can do is, <coughs> you don't have to have a million examples. You might just have a thousand examples, let's say. But you can get started from a model that works really, really well. For example, our best image model that we've open sourced and made available, and that's what this example talks about. Take the top part away, just train that on your data set from the point that it's already trained on. So it's just going to learn to classify the flowers. It already understands images well, so it doesn't have to really learn what kind of features are important for classifying images. It knows that already. It can just take your particular models, your particular data, 
and learn to just separate those out into different classes. <laughs> so there are a few tools that I would like to mention at the end or that you can play with or that you can use before you go in terms of um, you know, just making things work well for you. So you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with Apache Spark, which is used for um, doing analysis and doing learning on a large data sets. So there, are, there is an integration of Spark with, with uh, TensorFlow. Somebody at Databricks did that, where you can actually take some images. You can create, it's very simplistic in the sense you can train a lot of different models and really use it to pick the best model. You, you do that a lot because there are some hyperparameters like, say, learning rate or how big should your model be, et cetera. You maybe try 10 different models and use that to pick the best one. Another thing I would like to point you to is Google's own cloud machine learning platform. We announced this a couple of months ago. It's under limited preview right now, but you can sign up and you know, we'll make it accessible to you soon, where you can really have the same power of TensorFlow that you have on your machine, say, but maybe you don't have the compute resources or you don't want to manage all the resources that you need to really run at large scale, and cloud takes care of all of that for you. So you can basically do, you can experiment on your machine, make sure you understand what you want to do, and then push it off to the cloud, let it take care of running large scale stuff. Then a few examples of what you can do with models that have already been trained by others and really take them and just apply them. Okay. Uh, there are some APIs on the phone today for what are called the mobile vision APIs, which allow you to do face tracking. So let's say you have pictures, it allows you to, it identifies parts of the faces, so it first identifies the face, and then like parts of the face like the eyes, nose, et cetera, so you can do different kinds of things with it. It also recognizes barcodes and QR codes and automatically understands and you know, parses them for you. The, on the cloud, there are also some APIs for vision and speech and translation, which you can basically just send your image and it tells you what kind of image it is among a lot of different classes. For speech, again, you can upload data, upload speech, and it'll give you back text of whatever kind. For translation, you can give it text in one language, say English or Japanese or whatever makes sense for you, and it's gonna convert that to another language. So, so many different APIs, and this is a growing area that you should continue to watch out for. <clears throat> so now for the future, right? It, it is really, you know, I started by saying it's really not the future, but it is. It, it is the present and the future. It, it's just wanted to call out that it's important for you to start thinking about it now, not wait for the future, really. And it, it's really, you know, your turn to start thinking about how you can incorporate machine learning into everything that you do. What people are looking for today is not just applications that do what they want, right? There are tons of things that are already doing that. How can you add that edge? How, how can you make it really better for that user by understanding what they want, right, before they ask for every single thing? And, and that's really something that you can do. Think about this as you build your next application, as you build your next product. And I think that's how we'll change the future. That's how we'll make machine learning part of the future. So wanted to leave you with some places, some pointers to where you can read more about TensorFlow. It's on GitHub and their docs on tensorflow.org. And going back to my reference for TikTok, you know, TikTok's waiting for you to really make the difference to do these things now. And thank you. <laughs>